Greetings everyone, Low Rent Caboose here with the next installment of Battletech In Depth. Today's topic is something near and dear to the heart of my XO and mechanic. Ballistic weapons. Yes, Defalto loves the ballistics. Not only the guns themselves, but the history, development, and construction of them. Warp Angel, however, has a different passion which is tangentially related to this video. A ballistic weapon is typically defined as a device that uses some kind of explosive or rapidly conflagrating propellant to move an object designed to defeat armor, either through careful engineering, explosive tipped rounds, or in the case of everybody's favorite high caliber autocannons, brute force. But there are things like mass drivers, railguns, gauss cannons, and experimental weapons along a similar vein that have necessitated reclassification. So instead, they are classified as a weapon that fires a projectile that is unguided and unpowered. Once it leaves the barrel, it's on its own. Now, there are some caveats like smart autocannon rounds that can course correct minor degrees, and while yes, they have some propellant on board to do this, it doesn't add to the velocity of the round in any meaningful way. It just alters the trajectory. Then there are gyrojet rounds, which are basically small ballistic rockets. Note the link there. It still fires off a one-time accelerating charge that, once burned out, leaves it on a set trajectory once things like gravity and air resistance are taken into account. In layman's terms, it's still a bullet fired out of a gun. Ballistic weapons are a popular choice for mech pilots and ground troops for two basic reasons. Firstly, they are mechanical in nature, which means that with a suitable toolkit, most common issues can be resolved on the field with little risk to the operator. Second is low heat output. Oh sure, if you fire 20 AC-10 rounds without stopping, you'll build up some heat, but nowhere near as much if you fired 20 PPC shots back to back. In fact, it won't even add up to a third as much heat. The drawback, like most other ammo-fed weapons, is just that. Ammo. It's heavy, it's bulky, it explodes, and once you're out, the weapon is effectively useless for any purpose other than being a really expensive and complex club. Let's take a deep breath and plunge into the ups, downs, ins, and outs of ballistic weapons. Like usual, we'll be discounting nail scaval weapons, though this time we will touch briefly on artillery. With the basics out of the way, let's get a good look at ballistic weapons and the people that love them. Like Steve Irwin, but with guns. Hey, isn't she a beaut? Now, the projectile itself is small, but don't let that fool you, mate. This is a hard hidden little bugger that can nail a fly to the wall at 100 meters. We'll just leave her right here for now. Nobody kill me for that, please. Now, the history of the ballistic and or slug throwing weapon is important for context. Slug throwing rifles and cannons are some of the oldest and in some cases simplest of weapons, to the point where if someone was knowledgeable enough, they could construct their own if the elements were present in the environment around them. If you have carbon, sulfur, and potassium nitrate, also known as saltpeter, mixed finely in the proper amounts, congrats! You either just made an explosive charge or an extremely primitive rocket fuel. The determining factor is packaging. Without some kind of rigid container or chamber to contain the charge and resulting blast, it just kind of burns. But, if you can come up with something that's strong enough to hold together, and anything from bamboo to hollowed out hardwood trees have been used, and pack a projectile on top of it, instead of burning it will explode and all that force will act on the round, propelling it forward. This was originally used in primitive rockets on ancient Terra. By primitive, I mean it. They didn't always go off. Sometimes even if they did, they didn't generate enough force to propel the round. Sometimes they just exploded instead of launching, and they weren't accurate at all. That meant, unless you let off dozens, sometimes even hundreds at a time, you were unlikely to hit anything other than the ground. Projectile weapons hit a peak with gunpowder cannons in the 15th and 16th centuries, and plateaued for a few hundred years until the late 18th century. Then, at the start of the 19th century, innovation started seeping out of the woodwork until the middle of the century where development of them suddenly exploded. Pun intended. Now, Defalto is one of our resident history buffs and has been dying to speak on this subject for quite some time. So, he's going to hit the main points of ballistic weapon development from the mid-19th century up until the mid-21st century. Hey, right, so, mid-1800s on Old World Terra. There was, for the time, a massive scale civil war going on. This is when we saw a lot of innovation when it comes to guns. Cannons weren't complex affairs that were limited to ships and railway cars anymore. Now they could be towed by a horse and set up with a crew of three men. Rifles went from one shot every 45 seconds to one shot every five. 
Handguns were no longer a one and done kind of deal. Now they had a revolving chamber that held six rounds and were much faster to reload than any other design to date. Gun and cannon design stayed more or less the same for a period of about 50 years. Then, in the beginning of the 20th century, we started getting things like magazine-fed pistols, holding more ammo and reloading faster than their more common revolver counterparts. We went from lever-action rifles to semi-auto and then full-auto weapons, where bullets would fire as fast as you could squeeze the trigger or if you held it down, the weapon would cycle until there were no more bullets left in the magazine. Artillery went from 200 to 500 meter range cannons to the dozens, if not around 100,000 kilometers and impacting at a steep angle, which imparted more energy and also made them harder to shield against. Midway through the 20th century, we saw a lot of different iterations on these designs but most importantly, we saw the first self-guided missile munitions. They were slow, loud, and could be shot down, but they could also go a range that no other weapon could match. Now, before anyone tells me that the bad guys used those weapons, yes, I know. This is about the technology, not so much who used it and how. Besides, everyone copied and improved on the design. And then they added nukes to suborbital rocket platforms, plus some effective guidance and control systems. Thus, the first nuclear ICBMs, or Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. Yeah, now you have the power to nuke your enemies from the comfort of your favorite chair. To be perfectly honest, Things didn't really advance a whole lot for quite a few centuries. To quote our favorite professor from Van Zandt. Yes, as the ultimate answer to the question, you are in what army? However, after some upsets, glassing whole planets and irradiating entire surfaces of a planet, more than a couple of these great house leaders decided if they wanted somewhere to live tomorrow and the day after that. They ought to quit turning real estate into nuclear exclusion zones. So, the Mackie, the Battle Mech, tanks, planes, subs, etc. They all needed new weapon systems, and they needed ones that worked on every trigger pull. Lasers were cool, and PPCs were nice, but they were big, hot, and heavy. Meanwhile, your basic principle of pull trigger round go boom had essentially already been scaled to the mech size. Very little refinement was needed to bring the weight and complexity down to make them viable to the average house military. And from there to the periphery states, and even further to militias and pirates. Artillery took a back seat for a while until the succession wars. So you'll see a lot of artillery cannons out there that were actually worse than the pre-Age of War designs. However, one of the most effective and most famous is the Long Tom and its variants. The cannon weighs 30 tons and each round 200 kilos. Battlefield mobile, quick to set up and tear down, this became one of the anti-invasion weapons of choice during the succession wars. It was big, it could tear apart a lance of mechs with a few good hits. And compared to other technologies, including to fix a fusion engine, which might as well have operated on magic at this point, it was incredibly cheap and simple. Now, back to the best CO and boss I've ever had. Wait, who the fuck wrote this? <coughs> yeah, Bob, no idea where that come. Moving on. Your average ballistic weapon is a variation of firing pin strikes primer, primer ignites main charge, main charge combust and propels projectile. There are rail guns which use a conductive projectile as part of the firing mechanism. It completes the circuit, generates a massive magnetic field and propels itself out of the barrel. Then there are Gauss rifles, mass drivers and similar which use huge arrays of magnets and switching hardware to fire magnet groups in rapid succession drawing a projectile down the barrel and making it exit at massive speeds. 
Infantry scale is what everyone is used to looking at for the most part. Handguns, rifles, and weapons related to both. There are as many variants, makes, models, and modifications as there are people in the sphere, so we're just going to move on. Next are what are called support class projectile weapons. These are mech scale but man operated and portable by way of being towed to their emplacements by some kind of vehicle. A crew of two or three typically operates one of these, and while not super effective in the field against mechs and tanks, if you get them in an ambush position, a platoon of these can pull apart lighter units in a hurry and disintegrate other infantry and even battle armor units. Mechs have the same machine guns for opposite use. They're almost always used as anti-infantry or a last-ditch, oh shit, everything else is broken move. When placed on a mech, they produce no real heat. They have their own integral cooling jackets, and the massive amount of metal surface area they're bolted to will dissipate any lingering heat. Because of this, there are some platforms built around the mech machine gun, like the Piranha. Tiny, fast, and with 12 machine guns, it has 20% more damage per second than your average AC-20 with zero heat and 50% of the ammo consumption. What's the catch? Well, mainly a maximum range of 90 meters. That's why larger units use them as oh shit weapons or anti-infantry. They just can't close range fast enough to be effective with them. And now on to the meteor guns. Autocannons. There are many makes and models of autocannons, but they're all classified the same way, as a 2, 5, 10, or 20 model. This refers to its relative damage output. The AC-2 delivers the same damage as a machine gun, but at a maximum effective range as 720 meters, according to the Battlefield Technology Simulator, of which Warp and I have prepared a demo. So I'm going to shoot my auto cannon at your Marauder uh, about 18 and a half inches away. Uh, your max range is 18 inches. What? That the rule book says that your max range is 18 inches. You can't make that shot. That's not how auto cannons work. That's not how ballistic weapons work at all. It's an aggregate of all the auto cannon manufacturers for that particular mech and that's what it says that their average max range is. Okay, so, um, that, you do realize that autocannons are ballistic weapons, and there's two basic kinds of ballistic weapons. Those that fire things that explode, high explosive, and those that shoot things really, really fucking fast and blow holes in armor. Either way, there's not some arbitrary line in the sand where the weapon stops becoming effective. If I hit you with some, with a high explosive round that's moving as fast as a softball, it's still going to explode with the same amount of force as it was going faster. So I should be able to use my ballistic computer, lob it up, drop it on your head, and have it go boom. Or, as is the case with this particular variant of the Centurion, it's a high velocity autocannon, which means it's trying to punch through armor by shooting something at you really fast. And it's just not suddenly going to lose its armor penetrating properties at some arbitrary distance. Well, for the purposes of this game, it does. Well, this game sucks. Ow. <sighs> now that that's over with, guns. Guns! You get to use them! Big guns, small guns, future guns, all guns, stupid guns, unacceptable! Auto cannons come in multiple firing types and two main styles for the solid slug variants, burst fire or single shot. That is to say, they fire a burst of smaller rounds or fire one huge one. Most opt just to fire a single slug due to being able to land all that damage in one spot. But the burst fire has its merits, mainly that if you miss with the first couple shells, you can walk your fire into the target and hit with the rest. So an AC-2 does 2 damage at long range, and an AC-20 does 20 at roughly the same range as a medium laser. Yes, we're still going to use the Battle Technology Field Simulator for values because it gives more context for people to understand the differences. Okay? Okay. Naval autocannons fire multi-ton rounds, so yeah, context is hard. Two naval autocannon rounds can core out an atlas vertically, straight through the head and down to its feet, leaving probably not even those left. So after the inner sphere's best and brightest got pounded into snail snot, along with the factories used to produce everything, we just had your bog standard autocannon. After the Grey Death Legion liberated the Star League memory core from Helm, we had a lot more. We had LBX autocannons that could hot swap ammo types between solid slugs and what were essentially canister rounds, serving as a giant anti-mech shotgun, being generally longer ranged and cool operating due to the construction and more heat conductive alloys. LB20X on a hunchback? Oh yeah. <laughs> 
We also had so-called ultra auto cannons, which could cycle twice as fast at the risk of jamming. Initially, we only had the LBX-10 and Ultra-5 models, whereas the clans had everything. Smaller, lighter, and longer ranged, so we had some work to do to level the playing field. First up were light autocannons, available in the 2 and 5 models. Basically, if you sawed off the end of a rifle barrel and used lighter materials in the rest of the guns, that's what these were. Not as far reaching, but with a maintained damage potential, now you could mount two light autocannon 5s on a Cicado instead of a single Ultra AC-5, and then, other similar heavy scout designs gave these guns a side eye. For those of you that love to send rounds down range until everything stops twitching, rotary autocannons came out. Also limited to the 2 or 5 models, these were similar in idea to the Ultra models, but surpassed them by a factor of 3. You could burst fire whole slugs up to 6 in just a couple seconds depending on the firing mode you wanted. This spit a tremendous amount of damage down range, allowing a rotary AC-5 to surpass the damage potential of an AC-20 at much lighter weight and smaller size. They achieved this by basically upscaling a minigun. Two main drawbacks. One, they were sensitive. They were much more likely to jam at higher firing rates, and while you could potentially clear it in the field, there was always that risk that it would stay jammed until someone could field strip it. Second, they ate through ammo faster than canopians going through their powdered battle supplements, the inhaled kind. These were meant for short and hard engagements where damage flying down range was more important than endurance. The common theme with all these new autocannon types was money. They were not cheap. Ultra models got proliferated at an even pace with the LBX models, which dropped the price. Everything else remained in niche use for the most part. So what about that big stompy king crab that could use a new lease on life, but you can't afford a wholesale field refit? Well, multiple ammo types came out, some of which could be fed through a standard autocannon, but not advanced models. There are a lot of these, so I'm going to rapid fire them. Heh. <laughs> I made it funny. Lame. We have, in alphabetical order, Armor piercing, caseless, flak, incendiary, precision, and tracers. Easiest ones first, tracers. Everybody has seen these in small scale weapons, where every fifth round has a phosphorus payload in the round that ignites and allows it to be followed with the naked eye. Reduces damage slightly, but makes it easier to see where you're shooting. Armor piercing. It pierces armor. Shape charge, proximity fuse, Expensive, can be fired out of any model autocannon, and the potential to explode the ammo on an atlas without having to grind it down first is worth the money according to most. Flak. Anti-aircraft. Makes a field of shrapnel in the path of any kind of aircraft, with the idea that their forward airspeed will help the flak do the most damage. Cheap, been around for a millennia, effective unless you fire on a ground target. Infantry will laugh at you. Battle armor will destroy you. Incendiary. Sets shit on fire. Ballistic delivered napalm. Dangerous to mechs, devastating to tanks and infantry. Do not fire straight up. Precision. Oh my god, levels of expensive. Has tiny rocket charges on the round itself and contains its own targeting and tracking hardware. Contains multiple stages that allow it to alter trajectory to hit the designated target, which is fed to it from when first fired. You really can curve the bullet because fuck that locust in particular. Caseless. Rather than using some kind of metal shell to contain the propellant and the round, it uses a special propellant that gets compressed and takes up the entirety of the space outside the projectile itself. Benefit? Twice as many rounds per ton. Drawback? Your ammo feed system requires modification, so the gun can only fire caseless rounds. They jam, they explode easier, but the payoff of a hunchback suddenly having 20 rounds of ammo for the same rate as 10 may be worth it to you. Clearly we, uh, spherians? Spheroids? Spheroids? Whatever. We like our guns. But we aren't done yet, so hang on. What if you wanted a gun with no propellant, almost no heat, and could take the head of a daishi clean off at 800 meters? Well, thanks to both the Helm Memory Core and Clan Salvage, the Gauss rifle was remade. A little heavier than the Clan model, it launched a solid nickel slug way above the speed of sound. The entire thing was run on magnets. It has a slow rate of fire because even military fusion engines can't dump that much power on demand, and it needs to be delivered in sequence. The entire gun has its own energy storage and delivery system. A bank of supercapacitors gets charged, and when a fire order is given, 
The first magnetic coil is energized, which pulls around into the chamber, such as it is. Then it kicks off the others in sequence, sending it fast enough to impart the same destructive force as a clan ERPPC with less than 10% of the heat output. The ammo, being solid slugs, is impossible to make explode, though it does melt down and become useless. The gun, though, if you hit it during or just after the charging sequence, well, all that energy has to go somewhere, and in this case, it dumps itself into the chassis of the mech, making for a giant fused metal mess and taking out any nearby components. Ours wasn't quite up to the same standard as the clan model, so we came up with the light version. The damage output is roughly half, however the range is increased to equal clan Gauss rifles, and a ton of the ammo has twice as many rounds in it. The rifle itself is lighter and smaller too, adding a little to its utility. These pair really great with stealth mechs. Then we took it in the other direction and made the heavy Gauss. This thing is so massive, you can't even mount it in the arms of a mech, the recoil will shear them right off even when compared to the twin AC-20 King Crab. This comes with multiple downsides. 20% more weight per shot than an AC-20, restricting its endurance. It weighs 18 tons, limiting it to all but some of the biggest designs. The size of the round itself lends it to sharp damage falloff. At close ranges, it does 20% more damage than an AC-20, but at long ranges, it does roughly half. The bonus is just that, horrendous damage without much heat. More damage potential than an AC-20 with the heat of a small laser. Now the astute among you may have noticed that clans hate being outdone. They haven't managed to replicate rotary cannon designs, but they are jealous of them, same with the heavy Gauss. So they made the Hyper Assault Gauss, which is basically a rotary Gauss rifle. It doesn't shoot full-sized rounds, but much smaller ones out of a rotating barrel for an extremely high rate of fire, long range, and low heat. They fire a massive cloud of Gauss rounds in a couple seconds, aiming for accuracy by volume. This is possibly to get back at the IS quacks over at the NAIS that developed the Silver Bullet Gauss to combat elementals. The Silver Bullet Gauss is for infantry of any kind and basically just a frangible Gauss round. The cannon is fragile and the rounds are too susceptible to things like frequent jamming and or having to clean flak out of ammo bins. This made them unpopular, but none could deny their ability to one-shot an entire platoon at 800 meters. Two shots for a battle armor squad. I'm not going to go too much into artillery, but a 200 kilo shell lobbed at high inclination and long distance, basically an AC-20 round impacting at a steep angle from a height measured in kilometers. There are snub-nosed versions that make it easier to hit closer, 1-2 to two kilometers, but they're huge and heavy and the ammo weighs a lot so they aren't common. One last area that's somewhere between missiles and projectiles are mech mortars. These were seen as a step backwards from LRMs until the advent of the anti-missile system. Then they were expanded on and given additional ammo types, similar to the custom AC ammos available. They can fire direct or indirect just like LRMs and have a similar range, only difference being that since they're a large, unguided, and unpowered round, AMS rounds impacting them have almost zero chance to destroy the round before it itself impacts. One big thing that sets these suckers apart from autocannon rounds is the variability in payload. They can be used with smoke rounds, flares, anti-personnel, and they're ungodly cheap. Clans have their own versions too, largely unchanged in function. They come in 1, 2, 4, and 8 tube launcher systems, which are the same size and weight as the equivalent LRM 5, 10, 15, or 20. The longest part of the energy weapons video is going to be the shortest part of this one, the ideal use for each weapon or round. A lot of these are already explained just in the name, armor piercing for big targets, flak rounds for aircraft, etc. So let's put ammo aside and talk about the guns and their usage. The lower caliber cannons, your AC-2s and 5s, usually go on lighter, faster moving mechs. This is mostly because of weight and space, but also because they can keep maneuvering to keep the weapon in its ideal range bracket. AC-10s on medium mechs aren't common, and an AC-20 is much less so. I'll cover the noteworthy designs in a minute. Your Gauss type rifles get put on designs that need the damage output and range, but don't have a lot of space left over for heat dissipation. LBX autocannons go on things meant to either do infantry cleanup or go fishing for critical components on a target with breached armor. Ultra autocannons honestly can go on anything that needs a little extra oomph. An Ultra AC-20 is a really unpleasant surprise to turn around a corner and find, and an LBX-20 can sandblast the armor off of most light mechs and a decent number of mediums. As I already mentioned, rotary autocannons go on designs that need to pump rounds downrange to cause damage and aren't super concerned about endurance. These are usually garrison or defense-oriented designs, something that stays near the ammo stores. 
Now, like before, I feel I'd be doing this category of weapons a disservice if I didn't mention popular and important platforms that use them. This time, we're going to start with tanks. The Demolisher was groundbreaking. Mounting two AC-20s, an internal combustion engine, and enough armor to weather most firepower headed its way, this tank could threaten assault mechs and make anything smaller than 60 tons go away faster than prosecutor at a Capellan war crimes trial. If the Demolisher was a guardian angel to the infantry, the Demolisher too was their god. Mounting one LB-20 and one Ultra-20, this was bigger, more heavily armored with a fusion engine and in the space of 10 seconds can double tap a target with its Ultra-20 and fire a mech-sized cloud of shrapnel into the open hole, taking apart the mech's internals like a combustion-powered cheese grater. The Hollander and Hollander II are good examples of a weapon needing a good platform. In this case, the mechs were literally designed around the massive Gauss rifle. Sporting that kind of firepower in a medium and light design respectively was a massive surprise for anyone pushing a garrison or that has a slowly approaching firing line. Almost a kilometer out, these mechs can open up and either make the opposition scurry for cover or force them to advance. The Blackjack, of course, is a noteworthy design that makes full and effective use of the AC-2. With decent armor, jump jets, and excessive amounts of ammo, this mech can play jumping jack flash all day long and keep pinging away at you all the while. Going in the other direction, the Jaeger mech and Rifleman tried to do something similar with more supporting firepower. The Jaeger mech has two AC-5s, two AC-2s, also with plentiful ammo. It can send rounds downrange all day long, and the pilot will stay comfortably cool the entire time. The Rifleman, when used the way it's designed, can threaten most medium and some heavy designs. However, with its notorious low amount of heat sinks and predominantly en energy heavy loadout, any commander that tries to use it outside of its fire support role is going to have a very expensive scrap pile in short order. The Hunchback, of course, is a popular choice for urban defense and combat in general thanks to essentially being built around a single AC-20 and a couple medium lasers to back it up. To any pilot that dreads rounding a corner into a heavier design, this is the mech you want. If the target is still up after two salvos, you needed to be somewhere else anyway. The clans took this and remixed it times two. The Hunchback 2C has twin Ultra AC-20s and not much else including armor. Mostly meant for a last chance to gain glory in combat, if the pilot can get the drop on a heavier design, it can make it evaporate in a majestic and horrifying quad tap. If the pilot does this twice, that's all the ammo it's got. Side note, the design is very successful in giving pilots a last chance before they die because they usually don't survive long in it. The Lyran made Blitzkrieg took this in the other direction. Borrowing the Cicada chassis, this design can top 110 km an hour with a single Ultra 20 as its only weapon. This is actually a fairly intelligent and successful design. Armored enough to take a hit, fast enough to avoid most fire and disengage at will, this is basically a heavy cavalry mech. When it runs out of ammo, it just hightails it to a friendly resupply depot where they stack a couple more mags in, slap the hood, and send it back to the front. The last design I want to mention is the King Crab. The Star League era version mounts two Gauss rifles. After that technology was accidentally destroyed maliciously, they put two AC-20s in it with some LRMs and found out, hey, this thing's still pretty damn good, and the design endured until the Gauss technology was recovered. Able to remove two to three tons of armor per salvo, only incredibly fast mechs or stupid pilots would attempt to face off against one without backup. Give that at range, you can't tell if it's sporting autocannons or Gauss rifles, most pilots took one on single-handedly were found to be lacking in sound judgment. That's pretty much all I have for ballistic weapons. There's a lot more you could dig up on noteworthy designs, experimental weapons and tactics, and of course naval class weapons. It all boils down to how deep into the weeds you want to go. I felt this was enough depth for a good overview and a solid working knowledge of common ballistic weapons. Hey Caboose sir, I figured out why the rules for the Battlefield Tabletop Simulator were such crap. You bought the Capella knockoff version, Tabletop Battlefield Simulator. You might want to get a refund. <sighs> God damn it. Well, thanks for sticking with me so far. This series took a little bit more to complete than I initially expected, which is basically a tagline at this point. Due to my self-imposed need for accuracy, I research, re-research, proofread, re-read, rehearse, and then record the lines. It takes a bit before I get a product I'm satisfied with, and the better I get at this, the more quality I expect out of the final result. 
Soon I hope to have a workflow ironed out that makes these simpler to produce and with a higher production value. That's all for now. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, maybe I'll see you on the battlefield.